Mr Keating? Yeah, I think David's right. What I think what we're talking about are credible medium-term so-called fiscal trajectories, right? In other words, if you issue lots of bonds, the value of the bonds go down. The way markets work, when the bond price is down, the yield is up. The yield is a function of the price. So uh, as if, you, if there are lots of bonds, massive issuances around the world, bonds are plentiful, uh, the likelihood is that before people will buy them in the future, they'll say, you'll have to give me a higher interest rate, right? The yield will have to rise. And this is the crossover point where we reach the point where if, if the yields on long-term treasury bonds end up going up, say, two percentage points, um, and this was the estimate of the IMF, that there's 200 basis points, two percentage points in long bonds. So if you call long bonds, what, 5%, 5 percent, five and a half, you're talking about 7 percent for, for long-dated treasury bonds, that means the housing rate is nine or nine and a half, right? So unless there is a convincing story by the American federal government and Congress and the British federal government, <laughs> British government and Congress and uh, Parliament that the budget trajectory of issuances is believable and credible, then if we get, if we get that, we'll get through. But if we get the spike in bond yields, then we're going to have a very slow growth world. That's the big, Correct. big issue. Yeah. Now we didn't uh, go through something similar, of course, in the 80s, but there is there is an extreme example here because when you deregulated the financial system, you did have some of these problems in the non-regulated sector. The building societies were the ones that went mad. So did the yeah. state banks. Mm. Now, in terms of the architecture of our financial system. Yeah. Um, there's obviously a great compare and contrast with what happened in the US. Yeah. If I could get to the question of why it didn't happen to us and why it did happen to the, to the, uh, you know, the poster child for capitalism. Yeah. Um, well, the answer is I took them off the streets, you see. <laughs> uh, uh, you despived the nation, yeah, I think, was yeah, the quote yeah. at the time. No, I did. I, I did. Uh, the Permanent Building Society, once I'd opened the system up for the regulated institutions, the fringe institutions which grew up on the edge building societies, state banks. And we had all these state banks, South Australian State Bank, West Australian State Bank, Victoria, all these problems. So basically I scooped them up into the federal, uh, federally supervised institutions. The Commonwealth Bank bought the State Bank of Victoria. We cleaned up the State Bank of South Australia. Uh, the St George Permanent Building Society became St George Bank. Uh, it, it started to collect other building societies and gradually I pulled them together. Uh, and the other thing I did was to develop a thing called the four pillars policy. That is, that is uh, keeping the banks from taking one another over to engender competition and not letting them do things other than basically commercial banking. That is buying deposits, making a judgment about you and me as a risk, lending us a mortgage and, uh, or lending a small business or a business money and going around. What I was determined to do in the 90s, early 90s, was keep them out of the casino. No proprietary trading, no lending to hedge funds. Uh, derivatives hadn't really started then. Uh, see, the banks are not really that clever. Uh, and once you understand that they're fundamentally pretty ordinary, you, if you can keep them in the box, you'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> providing you let them out, you let ordinary people into complex situations, you're not okay. Uh, and so the, one of the reasons we got through is that we did, have, uh, we did have them pinned down. You know, we didn't let them into the casino. And uh, uh, as a result, we've come through much better uh, but some of it, of course, is good luck rather than good management. I, th I think there's a lot to what Mr. Keating said, and let me put it a little bit in the American context. Uh, there's a very uh, talented writer in the United States named Calvin Trillin, who wrote that when he was he's in his 60s, and he said, when I was in college, um, only the people who weren't very smart went into banking. <laughs> and we had a pretty good run. 
The problem is that all these clever people went into banking and they started to invent all these fancy products and, they, and that, that's when we got into trouble. Um, and it's kind of funny in the way that things are funny because there's a little bit of truth to them. We kind of distorted our society where the, <coughs> the kids who went to Harvard or Stanford or the University of Chicago, the brightest of our youth, were lured to finance because the pay was so big. Way, way out of line to what you could make doing anything else, being a doctor or newspaper reporter or, uh, or, or uh, even an engineer. And as a result, we had lots of people who were busy inventing things that had a peculiar logic in that they made money for the company for which they worked, but they didn't really understand them in all their complexity, and they certainly didn't care about the uh, problems they were creating if, thing, if the house of cards fell down. They, we, had, we had a screwed up compensation system where you could get your bonus if everything fell apart two years later while well, you had your bonus and that was someone else's problem. Um, I think the second thing is that we did, we did in our country uh, allow some of our financial institutions to run casinos. AIG is the most extraordinary case. AIG was a big, powerful, successful insurance company that built a casino on the side in an unregulated patch of the American <coughs> financial system where they basically took a lot of bets from all the banks of the world and they had no money to pay them off if the, ba if the bets went bad. And the bets went bad. And that's 140 or 150 billion of the bailout money to AIG to pay off Deutsche Bank, uh, Goldman Sachs and the rest. Um, I think that we are now in the process of trying to rewrite the rules of finance we, in, in the United, there's, there's more belief in the value of financial innovation still in the United States than Mr. Keating believes in the, in the four pillar strategy here, but there's a lot more skepticism about it now than there was for obvious reasons. And then the other weird thing is <clears throat> we probably had too many banks, so they couldn't make very much money at conventional banking, so they had to do all this exotic stuff to get rich. And in Canada and Australia, fewer banks made higher profits, they made money on banking, and they didn't feel the need to build a, a derivative sweepstake and then lose the lottery. And that's um, a very important distinction, isn't it? Uh, not only did you have more players, but a greater proportion of those players were not regulated. Correct. Now, in the, um, in the sort of transition, we'll sort of take you from Ben Bernanke being the hero of the moment to how it is you fix this thing. I mean, this is a global economy with some very hot money running around the world. Uh, you know, globalisation seems to amplify some of these business cycles now and they turn them global. Pretty much every country went down uh, with a couple of notable exceptions in 2008 and we're all looking to Europe again and we're wondering whether they're going to drag us down again even though, you know, the trade relationship may not be what it was. So how do you get, how do you get from crisis management to a superstructure that reduces the risk of these sorts of episodes? I think it's a very good question. First of all, I don't think globalisation is an option. Globalization is a reality. We have to learn to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, in the crisis, the global coordination is actually a good story. The difference between the central bankers in the 1920s uh, <coughs> pissing on each other and causing a Great Depression, or the difference between, say, Copenhagen and the G20 on the financial crisis, uh, le le you should have some hope about leadership. That when things fell apart, the Europeans, the Asians, the British, the Australians came together and did what was necessary to prevent the global financial system from imploding. But now the problem is, how do we build an architecture that gives us the benefits of globalization without the, the, the having uh, serial crises? And I don't think we know the answer to that. Mervyn King, the governor of the Bank of England, is famous for saying the problem with these global banks is they're global in life and national in death that the taxpayers of the UK or Germany or the US end up picking up the tab when they, when they fail. And so we now see this elaborate uh, uh, dance at Basel and other places where they're trying to come up with some rules. And I think there's probably an enormous amount of goodwill and a lot of everybody looking out for their own national interests. And the question is whether they can overcome everybody trying to take care of their banks long enough to come to some global pact that allows us to have a system where banks have to hold more capital, bigger cushions, so they can absorb the losses, 
and where we have somewhat better guardrails on the highway of finance so that if they kind of veer off to the left or right, they don't take all of us with them. I think it's an enormous challenge. I know some of the people who are doing it. I have a lot of respect for them. And it's not easy. And they'll probably not succeed all the way. But I think that if they can move while the memory of the crisis is fresh, and the Europeans are helping us on that project, um, <laughs> we may actually get a, 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 some better rules and some global coordination because this cannot be done one country at a time. It just cannot. Mr. Keating, how would you write the global rules? Let's just assume you're, uh, you're taken out of retirement and this is your big project. <laughs> well, I, th I agree with David. I think that uh, uh, the coordination that came out of the G20 and I give our Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, his due. He was very significant in the organisation of the London meeting, as was Gordon Brown, but the most important contribution was, of course, Barack Obama attending it, giving it authority. Essentially, the G20 is establishing a more representative world structure. Uh, it means we've got the creditor states and the debtor states sitting in the one room, whereas with the old G7, we had mostly debtor states <laughs> uh, say for Japan and Germany, uh, sitting there. So uh, the, 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 one of the, re the real issues is that the underlying fundamentals that created the crisis are still with us. That is, the Chinese are still heavily in surplus, Germany is still heavily in surplus, neither the Germans... What we need is a new international settlement where the surplus countries start saving less and spending more, this is China and Germany and Japan, and the deficit countries start saving more and spending less. Now, the deficit countries are saving more and spending less, but the surplus countries are not. The Chinese have not shifted policy at all. Uh, the Germans have not shifted policy, they've only reinforced it. So we're, we're going to have the cloud is still being there, the black cloud is still out there. and when you have a surplus of savings around, this will, in the end, they will have to be borrowed. The question is, who's going to borrow them? The answer is the people who create them. The Chinese should be spending the money on themselves, lifting their own people out of poverty. The Chinese should not be essentially developing a great reserve of reserve savings. Now, why did they do it? They did it because of 97 Suharto and the IMF. In a G20 structure where the G20 will probably soon have the governance of the IMF, there's less reason for the Chinese to believe that they will be had by the fund, by the IMF or someone else in the West, if in fact they have a bigger vote at the table and they have a bigger say. In other words, by democratising the structure, we are removing at the source the reasons for the maintenance of the surpluses in the first place. So I think the G20 is a, really a big change. And to give Obama his due, he, he said, look, the United States can't do this alone. You know, this is a big change in itself. So I think the coordination really does matter, um, the legitimacy of it. Uh, but we have to, the great challenge for the world is really to move the Chinese out of investment into consumption. You know, the story of China is a story of urbanisation, a story of people moving to cities, towns and cities. Cities are full of people, the price of people normally goes up. So consumption in cities is, a, as it is in this country, as it is in the United States, a legitimate source of national earnings, income and wealth. What we've got to do is shift Chinese policy to more consumption away from investment. If that's the case, this big cloud starts to dissipate, you know, and uh, we start to see current account deficits, uh, current account imbalances start to moderate and even themselves up. And even the Germans have got to, uh, I think, at some point wake up to themselves. I mean, Sh Sh Merkel and Schwabel, they want, their policy is one Germany, one Europe, you know, <laughs> if uh, that is, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is it. In other words, they want fiscal discipline, fiscal discipline. But essentially what they're doing is vendor, their surplus is vendor financing the sale of Mercedes-Benz, BMWs, machine tools, all the things they do well. 
they sell these to the rest of the world and to Europe and they sell the money to pay for them. They vendor finance them. So they're either going to run a surplus and vendor finance this stuff or they're not. You know, I mean, to be saying, look, by the way, we're going to run a surplus. We're going to lend you all the money. Now don't spend it. That's what they're currently doing. This is the great conundrum going on there, you know. So, so, so Germany's got to decide whether it can continue to run this sort of surplus policy. I mean, remember what John Maynard Keynes said in the 1930s, beware of surpluses more than you'll be concerned about deficits, you know. Hmm. Now, we've got about five minutes to go. Thank you both for the, uh, for the discussion. Now, it's a big room, and uh, I'm going to try and check all three levels. Uh, we've probably got time for a couple of questions from the floor. Hi. Um, my question, I guess, is for both of you. What's your response to the argument that in an economy like Australia's in particular, uh, given our terms of trade boom and the, the robustness of our economy through the GFC, inflation becoming the next problem to handle here, and following on from your point, Paul, are we leaving too much of the heavy lifting to monetary policy, which is a rather blunt instrument to fight inflation, when we've got governments of the last 15 years not running fiscal policy to fight inflation, but in fact stimulating the economy further to counteract interest rate rises? Well, I think that uh, you have to count on central banks around the world to maintain a commitment to price stability. You and the East Asians are in an extraordinarily difficult situation right now because you have, they have to decide what is the bigger force in the world economy. This, is China going to continue to grow and be, lead, lead you to have too, over, an overheated economy here or is Europe going to indirectly lead China to slow down and, have, and not have it? So it's a tough thing. In the, and it's hard to be a small economy with favorable terms of trade and full employment. It's a problem we would very much like to have in the United States where we have high unemployment, falling prices, interest rates at zero, and no clue how to get to an Australia-like situation. Yeah. Well, I think um, the, cent the Reserve Bank here has moved rates back to what they call equilibrium more broadly, which is about 5% thereabouts. So, uh, uh, as David says, in the US, rates are still low because the Fed believes the stimulus is still necessary. Uh, the stimulus here is less necessary. The federal government stimulus is coming back. Uh, the lift in, in national income from, from higher commodity prices is pumping money into the economy. Uh, the Reserve Bank has lifted rates to, to, to make certain that that money is accommodated in a, high, in a, in a, a, a virtually a fully employed society. Uh, so I don't think there is an overemphasis on monetary policy. And the exchange rate, of course, by running up to 90 cents is chopping the top off the income. In other words, when you get a big income surge, which is threatening inflation, to moderate the surge, the exchange rate moves up. In other words, you get less... For every American dollar contract for iron ore, you get less A dollar proceeds if the dollar is high. Uh, so therefore, that's why the miners this week are very happy about the exchange rate going down. Uh, so the exchange rate left alone will actually chop the top off the income surge. So there's more than simply monetary policy moderating the income surge here. Um, so yet it may be that if demand continues, that interest rates will need to be higher. But as David makes the point, central banks have always got to keep their central focus on price stability, uh, and they will. I'll take a question from uh, number five, and we'll take one more after this one. So put in your bids at the end of this one. Mr Keating has started off by discussing process, the relation of interest rates, that's the price of money, to the bond market. David Wessel started the discussion on what happened in the American banks, where bad paper and bad debt, bad debt highly leveraged unwound the property market in America. But you also went on to say, sir, what's going to happen now in Europe? And here we have a much greater depth of debt in paper bonds. 
And that is the real market that can really shake up one way or another the world economy. I don't think Mr Keating's process, unless it's done very quickly, is going to cover what might be happening right now. In the American markets, the collapse of the euro has started shaking up the equity markets of the world. And the depth of debt in the, in the um, European market alone, in the term of trillions, I don't know if the structure can hold together to conserve that or create stability in that debt pattern and bond market of the world, especially starting from Europe. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, well, uh, I'm... Uh, the European Union is a, as much a political idea as is an economic one. That was a dream of people like Konrad Adenauer, the German Chancellor, post-war Chancellor, uh, and, uh, and uh, French ministers like uh, Schumann uh, tried to do things to avoid a third European war where Germany and France were pitted against one another for a third time. So they decided to have the common market and then after 20 years of development of that, Helmut Kohl and Mitterrand decided to have the European Union and with it a single currency. Uh, the, the problems with it is, of course, the, the fact there isn't the political union. Uh, the economic unions come without the political union, and without the political union we haven't had the budget authority, the sovereign fiscal... the, the, the budget authority over individual countries, that is, the budget, overarching budgetary authority over sovereign countries. But to date, I don't think that's really been a great problem. I still believe that uh, the inherent problems with the euro are in the peripheral countries, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Ireland, etc. And their problems are the, are the consequence of a big, long, one-off party with German interest rates. Now, they either get over this or they have to leave. So they go back to their own currencies. But I don't see the core failing. I don't see... I mean, since, since the euro, uh, European productivity has risen because people can't hide anymore. In a single currency, if there's a, a dip in productivity in one country, someone else will fill it up. So productivity has been rising in Europe. I don't really see that the European experiment is bound to fail. I don't think it will. It shouldn't fail. Uh, and if the cost of remedying it is that you have to let the peripheral countries fall out of it, that might end up being the cost. But I doubt v v very many communities in Europe will want to leave the single currency. Rather, they will want to repair their own competitiveness and stop the credit binge. It might take 10 or 12 years, but it's worth it to stay in it. So I must say I'm, uh, I'm still an optimist about, about Europe. Um, it's 320 million people. It's a massive market. Um, I don't see the world ending, uh, you know, the financial world in a crisis over this. OK, we'll grab one more question. Um, microphone number two. Hi. Um, one of the areas, I mean, you've been talking about the imbalances in the world. One of the areas the world hasn't always used historically is currencies. Um, we've seen the problem of Greece not being able to do value being a part of the euro. But one of the other areas, I mean, we saw a very strong rise in the yen during um, Japan's supremacy. But we haven't, we've got pegged currencies in Asia. We've seen a bit, I mean, we haven't been able to see a rise in, in the Chinese currency because it's pegged. Have you got any view on what's going to happen with that? I mean, there doesn't seem to be as much pressure as you might expect going on on that side. Have you got any view on well, what's um, likely to happen? The, uh, there's a great deal of pressure in the United States on the Chinese to let their currency rise. Uh, the strategy seems to be to yell at them until they do it, and then <laughs> when they don't do it, we say it's really in your interest to let your currency rise. Um, I believe the Chinese will let their currency rise because they're worried about inflation and it's hard to maintain a low inflation environment if you're holding your currency too low. But I have no doubt that the, the political leadership of the People's Republic looks at the last couple of weeks and tells the economic technicians, uh, come back in a couple of months, we're not doing it this week. Yeah, I think that's right. I agree with David. I think that... Um 
technically, in a floating exchange rate, you shouldn't be accumulating <coughs> reserves. The rate should rise such that the reserves are not capable of being accumulated. Uh, this is the point of them. Uh, but the Chinese Communist Party doesn't want to put its neck in the mouth of the West or the IMF or anybody else, so they've hang hung on to this managed system, which gives them also, also a sort of an artificial competitiveness. Their currency is valued, it's, the, it's called the real exchange rate. They are masquerading the real exchange rate by keeping the nominal exchange rate lower by huge daily currency interventions by the central bank. In the end, it's a losing, as David says, it's a losing game for the Chinese in particular and for the rest of us. So I think those things will change. Um, I think there's got to be, going back to the world in general, there has to be a change in attitudes about financial capitalism. Not just capitalism, but financial capitalism. Uh, David made the point in passing, the, we saw a five-fold increase in assets in the financial system over 20 or 30 years. The financial system is now uh, grossly, grossly larger than it used to be, and you could probably argue grossly larger than it needs to be. Um, uh, so, uh, some healthy disregard for the. I mean, I heard, uh, I saw some remarks David uh, made on radio. He said, "We're not commentating on sports here. Uh, we're commentating on people's lives." Uh, so therefore, we don't go clapping for the highest paid person at Goldman Sachs. We don't go clapping for the highest paid person uh, at uh, UBS or someone else, uh, these financial rock stars. Uh, there's got to be, I think, a cultural change, this sort of uh, celebrity which attaches themselves. I mean, look, look at this guy, Bono. God, you couldn't keep him out of it. Like if, there was a, if, if he heard we were here, he'd be here. <laughs> um, you know... Uh, uh, now, so uh, there, there, there was once a thing that society, years ago, society, when people talk about society, they talked about people who had moment and gravity and who added to society. Now, any little sort of pumped up rock star model, uh, you know, journo, high earning uh, uh, is... Uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is a celebrity, you know. And in the financial business, this has been a big problem. Uh, and I think we, we have to do something to shred this sort of celebrity thing and get back to the point David made, that we've got to be looking for value uh, from these people and not commenting on them because they're at the top of the bonus pool this year and they've made so much money. I mean, it's obscene and squalid. And... Uh, and And, and, and we, need, we, we need governments to visit pain on these guys, you know. I mean, you know... Uh, uh, anyway. OK, um, we're going to have to wind it up. We're a little over time, which is uh, credit to you all that you've, uh, you've been a very attentive audience and very good questions. Um, please give both our uh, speakers another warm round of your appreciation. Thank you. Thank you.